Around the world, people live different lives, doing different things that are unique and make us who we are, writing our own stories and learning new things along the way. We all learn different things. We all face different challenges and obstacles, but manage to get through them one way or another. We as humans go through our own journeys, and we learn as we build our own resilience. No matter how much we get beat down, what matters is how we get back up. And everyone loves a good story. Welcome to the Neil Coots Show. Thank you, everyone, for tuning in to today's episode of the Neil Coots Show. Today's guest is Robert Raymond Riopel. Ray. Robert is a personal empowerment coach, I would say. Um, he's really, he's, you know, T. Harv Eker's first protege. Um, what I find really inspiring about this guy is that the fact that he was a, about $150,000 in debt and he managed to claw, get himself out of it. I wouldn't say claw, but he can elaborate on that for me. But, um, yeah, he got himself out of it within nine months and was able to retire. Now, the thing is, you know, 20 years ago, I think it is, um, maybe a little bit less. He'll correct me on it, I'm sure. But, um, you know, 150000 was is probably today's worth a lot more, probably close to a quarter of a million. So it is a great achievement, you know, especially for a lot of people that would love to get out of this rat race. But not only that, Robert is also a, he's, he's a host of his own podcast, um, Success Le- Left a Clue, as well as he's an author of his own book. And plus he has many other education enterprises that he participates in because one of the things he loves to do and he can tell me all about it is helping others reach their full potential so without further ado thank you very much for coming on to the show there today robert oh thanks neil i'm happy to be here because i love technology that here we are on opposite sides of the planet and we're able to have a conversation like how cool is that that is cool i tell you what like because it wasn't easy um you know, 20 years ago, you know, before we had technology, even staying in contact with friends and family who had its own challenges, especially because the cost of being able to be in touch with people, when we did do it, we it was like a big occasion. But now that with technology, the accessibility gives me the opportunity to chat with people like yourself as well without, you know, um, having to fly across the world just to be able to get, you know, sit at a table with you. So... Yeah, no, it's awesome. I tell you what, it's really awesome. And I do th- want to thank you for coming on. <laughs> Happy to be here. So let's start off the bat there. Um, so who is Robert Riopel? Like what is uh, – like because I've heard that you came, you come from a big family in Canada, um, you know, the youngest of – what was it, five kids? Am I right? Four. I'm four, the youngest four. of four. My wife is the uh, – my wife's the youngest of five. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, um, what was life growing up in Canada for you? Was it something um, easy? Did it have any challenges? Like what, yeah, basically what was life growing up in Canada for yourself? Well, you know, when you talk about coming from a big family, so I'm the youngest of four, but my dad, as an example, second oldest of 10 kids, second oldest of 10. And my mom was one of eight kids. So big families all on all the way around and growing up, one of the biggest things that was important for my parents was, you know, you do what you need to do to take care of your family. Mm -hmm. And so even if you don't like a job, you take that job if it's supporting the family. And when I was younger, um, I didn't know what it was like, Neil, to be in a school for more than six months to a year, longer Uh than that, because to keep working and keep the family fed, my parents were constantly having to move around and take us with them so that they could get work so that they could, you know, find something to supply and make sure they were taking care of us. In fact, my parents were living in a motel when I was born. Yeah. So with my three oldest siblings, they were living in, in a motel room. And that's because that's the only way they could actually live to be able to work where they need to work. So growing up, it was a lot of moving. And that's one of the reasons why today I don't like moving. <laughs> yeah, no, I get that. Yeah, you're happy to be and in the one spot, huh? Yeah, and especially because, you know, I'm a naturally, people don't realize it, but I'm a naturally shy person. And so because I didn't know how long I was going to be somewhere, I didn't want to be there without friends, but I didn't know how to make friends. And so I would actually do some kind of crazy things to to get people to notice me so I could hopefully make some friends. So at least I could play with kids before we moved again. 
And uh-huh. it just kind of became part of my personality. Mm. Uh, even though I'm shy, I hide it by being outgoing so that I can sit there and go, hey, let's at least talk. Let's communicate. Let's, you know, let's get to know each other. Yeah. Before I'm moving on again. Ah, uh, yeah. So, yeah, that would have uh, presented you with some challenges growing up. Yeah, moving around a lot, you know, because yeah, you wouldn't know when was the next time you would be moving, and yeah, it would have, you know, it would have traumatized you a little bit as a kid because every time your parents go, "Look, Robert, we have to now move to another location," it would have broken your heart. Yeah. It did, but I don't know if I'd call it traumatizing because to us it was normal. Mm-hmm. Looking back now, I realize this was different because I look at how other families, some families, they're in the same house for 30 years or more, right? Yep. So to us, it was just a normal way of being. And it was not until we had something to compare it to that yep. we realized, huh, that was different. And that's when we moved from one province in Canada to another province. And all of a sudden, I, you know, we, even though we moved a couple times, we were still able to go to the same schools because we were in a smaller city. Oh, and often it's like, oh, this is what it's like to actually get to know people and actually see them in the next grade and see mm-hmm. them in the next grade. And we started doing activities like bowling or here in Canada, we have something called the cadet organization. And so at a young age, at 10, I was able to join what was called Navy League. And oh, yeah. from um, when I just before 13, I was able to then join Sea Cadets, which is the older version of it. And, and all of a sudden it was like life became even just, wow, OK, yeah, I'm used to being here and we're not going to be doing a big move anymore. No. So it, it kind of normalized for us to a new normal. And I think of it like this, Neil, yeah. it's almost like COVID. Yeah. Everybody's going, Oh my girl, God, the world's changed. Yeah. And it's totally different than what it was before. Mm. In some ways, I love the way the world's become. Yeah. In other ways, yeah, I go, I wish it could still do that. But then the, the new things that have come from it, it's just a new way of being. And so do you embrace it? Or do you resist it and go, but I want the old way. And, you know, that's kind of how I live my life now. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's funny you say that because when I when we had – because I'm from Melbourne, so I don't know if you know about Melbourne with COVID. We probably had one of the longest lockdowns in the world um, quite frequently in the media. So, um, But, yeah, for me, myself, I tried to look beyond having to travel and looked for what's the fruits of around you that could make you happy – and one of the things I come to realize is spending more time with family because in the West, oh, yeah. we're stressed out what we're going to get tomorrow, what we're going to buy. Everything's driven by money. But when you look at the East, it's not about what the future, it's about the now, what you have around you. Yes. And that's where they, why, or why they value family so much. Um, and it's important, like your mental health. So, you know, during COVID, everyone's stressing, oh, I can't go out. I could still go to the shop and buy the food I need and necessities. You know, I could still go down to the park. It was just like, you know, you could spend more time with family, which I think a lot of people have forgotten, I guess, because they're too busy trying to chase wealth. Is that right? I, I would totally agree with you. And and I've had, you know, to have the wake-up call to make you realize that because we, I, I love to teach people to find their passion and then follow their passion. Hmm. And that's what I've done a lot in my life. But I realized back in 2008, there's such a thing as overliving your passion. You know, yeah. you mentioned in the intro that I was T.R. Becker's very first protege. Yeah. When I started training, I started doing 40 to 50 full-on multi-day trainings in North America alone, not even wow. overseas yet. Mm. I was doing that a year, and I was at home only on average two days a month. Mm. Now, the yeah. only reason it worked mm. is, A, it was my passion – but B, my wife was working with me because she was running the logistics. So mm. we were still together. Yeah. And I was living my passion, not realizing there's such a thing as overliving it. And wow. I actually, after four and a half years of training, I got burnt out. Yeah. I, my health, I hadn't been taking care of my health. And often I had to take a year off. Mm. And that one year turned into three and a half years because I ended up going through two back surgeries. Wow. You know, I gained a lot more weight. My health just was not good. And I, I didn't even want to look at a, a suitcase. I was so burnt out. Wow. And so I realized, yeah, living my passion was great. But there's still got to be that balance. What yeah. about being at home? Mm. What about being? And after three and a half years, when I was asked to come out of retirement, yeah. because I'd learned that lesson, I said, absolutely, because I was ready. Because here's what happened, Neil. I went from overliving my passion, which is bad, Mm -hmm. to actually not living it at all. 
which is just as bad. Yeah. And I didn't have that balance. And I want your listeners and your viewers to understand that don't think that I'm any better than anybody else or yeah. I'm any different. Yeah. I have my ups. I have my downs. It, sometimes in Canada, we have a saying, it only takes a few kicks with a frozen muckle lock before you get it. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had to go to the extremes to realize what wasn't working. Yeah. And so when they asked me to come out of retirement, I said, absolutely. I'm ready. I want to do live events again. However, I will only do 20 trainings event maximum e- a year, 20 events a year. That's it. Wherever yeah. in the world you're going to use me. So that even though I was flying a lot, I still got to spend six months a year at home mm. doing whatever I wanted with my family. Yeah. And now understand to your listeners and your viewers, I'm not going to tell them that so that they go, I wish I want you to understand that create it, yeah. create that because how many people would love to be able to have six months a year yeah. to do whatever they want. Yeah. Now, fast forward when I came out of retirement in 2012, from 2012, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, and part of 20, I was averaging 18 to 21 events. I set my boundaries and I lived to them. Yeah. And I was still doing about 200,000 miles a year of flying because I was going overseas a lot. Yeah. And often when COVID hit, it taught me another lesson because I had always said, I'm going to slow down even more. Mm. I want to spend more time at home. Mm. And often the universe said, you know, sometimes, Neil, I wonder if I created COVID. <laughs> just saying, just saying. <laughs> because I was putting out the universe, I was going to slow down a bit. And it finally went, okay, buddy, you said you're going to do it. And all of a sudden, we, I went from 200,000 miles a year flying down to zero. So, so like, and you, it's, you know, yeah, you managed, <laughs> so like, you basically, <laughs> it's hilarious. You're like, you're saying that uh, you manifested. Uh, the ability to spend more time at home with family and I guess the universe gave you COVID and so your your prayers were answered basically because the, the deal is like, the well, my philosophy or my motto is work a job you like, never work a day in your life. But then, you know, and a lot of people say that, but the thing is what people don't realise is you've got to still element, you still got to include an element of balance you know, between yeah. work and play or work and family because even if though you do what you like, you can still burn yourself from it. And the worst thing you want to be doing is, uh, again, traumatizing yourself from being burnt out that you don't want to go back to it. Yeah. Even though you really enjoy what you're doing and the passion because I guess, guess that's what gives you the thrive to live um, is being able oh, to do absolutely. what you like, yeah? What would you say? Yeah, and a lot of people go – a lot of people say, yeah, but Robert, I can't make money doing what I love. Mm. And maybe with the knowledge you have, you can't. So learn more. Yes. Uh, and, and I'll tell you, when I became a student in 2001, it, you know, my very first training was with T. Harvecker as a student. And it just totally blew my mind open and opened my life up. And I went, wow, mm. you know, this little information I got in one three-day training allowed me to create financial freedom nine months later. You know, 150000 as you said, $150,000 in personal debt, not including my business, yeah. personal debt, all of a sudden, because I changed my mindset, I looked at, you know, okay, I don't know what I don't know. Mm. So if there's something I don't know, I better learn. Next thing you know, nine months later, I go from that over 150000 in personal debt to being retired completely wow. financially free at the age of 32. Mm. And my mind went, that worked? <laughs> <laughs> if this little information gave me that result, what would more learning do? And that's why even today, even though I've taught over half a million students around the world, Hmm. I will never quit being a student. I will never quit learning because the moment I quit learning, I'm done. I'm done because the world's always changing. And so, you know, when you go back to, and again, you know what I said, I'm not different than anybody else. When COVID hit, Hmm. I instantly went into the victim role for me. Why is this happening to me? I went into that role. Wow. And it took about two weeks before my wife and I came out of it. Mm. And when we started realizing what we were doing to ourselves, our mind went into two very powerful words. And if, if your listeners and your viewers are taking notes, I want them to write these two words down. They are game changing. They are life changing. Yeah. And those words are what's next. Yeah. What's next. Cause think about this. Yeah. I go from, you know, thank goodness I have passive income, other businesses, yeah. 
but my main income, my main cash flow was coming from me traveling around the world. Yeah. All of a sudden, I can't do that anymore. Mm. So what's next? And we that's had right. to do a total reinvent. Yeah. And that's why, you know, I, I'm blessed. I live on a very beautiful property, an acreage my wife and I bought four years ago with the intention that one day we would build our own training center. So again, I wouldn't have to travel as much. I'd be able to have my students come to me from around the world. That's cool. And so that plan was six, seven, eight years, nine years down the road. Mm. So also when we went, what's next? My wife went, well, why don't we build the training center? Yeah. Well, of course, as soon as we said that, all the what ifs. But what if this COVID thing lasts long? What if it doesn't work out? What if we don't travel again? And that's when two more very powerful words come in. Mm. And again, I want your audience to write these down. Yep. Those next two words are all in. All yeah. in. Yeah. My wife and I went, you know what? If this is what we're going to do, we're going to make it work. And we, it took us over a year and a half. But all of a sudden, next thing you know, where I'm sitting talking to you now, yeah. I'm in my office, which is part of a 2,400 square foot. So that's about what? 210 meter square building that wow. we added onto the back of our house. Mm. So I've got my office beside me. I've got a 1,500 square foot training facility, which you got to experience me using yeah. on a training and just a portion of it. And then on the other side of that, the wall of that is a 900 square foot I call it my wife's she shack. It's her <laughs> prep area. It's her, yeah. And so often she's got this huge garage to do whatever she wants. Yeah, Had yeah. we sat there and kept playing woe is me, we never would have built that. If yeah. we hadn't built it, I wouldn't now be do- touching thousands of lives around the world, being able to do it from my home, where all of a sudden I'm done on camera. Yeah. I walk through into my old garage, into my house, and I'm like, hi, honey, I'm home. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, wouldn't we all be able, love that, you know, be able to work from home type of thing, you know? But that's the thing, like, yeah, you, it's quite easy to play the victim card. But the, the thing is, like, if you want to – you have to keep moving forward or if you don't want this misery and depression that will come with playing the vip, victim card, you just got to keep moving forward. You got to find something different. You got to keep tinkering with the formula until you find something that actually works. Because yeah. once you stop, then you fail. That's it. But you don't. You haven't failed right. yet if you're keeping. If you keep going, you know it's only when you stop. Yeah. Yeah. That, and, and be willing. Yeah. And, and here, here's a key word for everybody as well. Be willing mm-hmm. to ask for assistance. Uh, Quit yeah, trying yeah. to do it all on your own. And, and look, <laughs> that, that was me. I'm like, I'll figure it out. I'll do it on my own. I got this handled. And then I'd struggle. But the moment yeah. I started allowing people, you know. Look, I was teaching people for years how to expand their businesses, how to scale, and I never had a personal assistant. Yeah, yeah. And I'd be telling them how important it is, but I never had one. And all yeah. of a sudden, the, you know, one hand to clap is like, uh, <laughs> duh. You know, you're telling everybody else is the way to do things, and you're not doing it. Also, when I got a personal assistant that took such a load off of me, I now had the energy and space to focus on what I was good at. Yeah. All of a sudden, I, I made a business partner with a person I've been training with for 15 years around the world. All of a sudden, we, because of COVID, we came together and said, well, why don't we just start doing business together? And now we're doing six and seven figure clients, bringing on six wow. and seven figure clients yeah. because the two of us together, we're both good, amazing individually, but you put us together, we're unstoppable. Mm. And, and, it's, and it's funny how that came about, if, if you'd like to know how it came about. Yeah, go on, share it. I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> Well, one of, because I've trained for not don't do the age, you know, don't figure <laughs> out my age now. You know? <laughs> I've been training for twenty one years yeah. now <laughs> since I retired. Wow! And uh, when COVID hit, one of the first trainings I got to do live, um, one of my former students said, "Robert, I want you to come down." He says, "I want you to design a five day training for my students." He has a very rich market. And I said, absolutely. He said, and then come down and sell it at my event in, in Florida. I said, absolutely. The first call I made was to my friend Aaron and said, Aaron, I said, I'm being contracted to write a five-day course. I would love for you to do it with me in a partnership. Yeah. And he's like, I'm in. And we started working on it. And both of our wives asked us the same question in a different way. My wife said, well, you could have written it on your own. Why did you include Aaron? And Aaron's wife said, you know, you could write it by yourself. Why is Robert asking you to work with him? 
And our answers were, together, we could both create an amazing course. But um, separate, we could. But combined, life-changing. Life-changing. And because I'm not trying to figure it all out, and he's not trying. When we start brainstorming, our wives think that we're crazy. They're, How are you guys making so much money having so much fun? Because we get on calls, and we're doing Zoom calls, and every day we talk every day, and, and we're creating, and we're having a blast. And they come walking behind us going, why are you guys having so much fun? That should almost be illegal. <laughs> and we're like, this is the way it's done. Because well, quit trying to do it on their own. We've, as children, we're taught, figure it out on your own. And then we wonder why success doesn't come as easy. We wonder why we get frustrated. We wonder why we give up on things. But if you're willing to be vulnerable enough to ask for assistance from people and know they may not even do it as well as you, yeah. But if it frees you up to be able to do what you're even more spectacular at, that becomes win-win. Yeah. Well, but Robert, uh, will you make as much money? Uh, no, you'll probably make more. <laughs> that's because nice. Because you're leveraging. Yeah, that's Well, and, and think about this, right? Mm. Because on my own, I could take on one or two clients. And so I could do good if I'm creating for one or two clients. But combined, and now with a team, tomorrow my time, so you're already there in the future for when I'm going to be having, we're going to be bringing on a client. We're going to be fi- mm. finally closing a client that will be a seven figure a year wow. contract yeah. from one client. Wow, and that's... if I was taking it on my own, I wouldn't go for that big of a client. Neither would my partner, but together we're like, uh, yeah, <laughs> well, <laughs> why yeah. not? You're a team. And I think, I think that the other thing as well is when, when you do it with someone that's just as passionate about the same thing you're passionate about, the journey is so much greater because you've got someone to share and enjoy the fruits with, you know, because it's not the same as going, hey, love, I just made a million dollars because I don't know, like, yeah, it's they'll be happy for you, but you haven't shared the journey together where if you're doing it with a friend, it's like a sports team, you know, how much pa- passion and, you know, energy that – because, yeah, you've finally achieved or you've achieved the goal that you guys have set out to achieve. But being able to do it with someone, yeah, like you said, it does take a load of, load of work off your shoulders as well. So you can yeah. – you don't get burnt out as easy, yeah? And, and he, he's had bad days where I've covered for him. I've had a – you know, this last month and a half has been a rough time of my life hmm. because my dad just passed away. Uh, sorry about that. Sorry to hear. And that. I'll – thank you. And I'll tell you, it hit hard. Mm. And my mom passed away 15 years ago. And, and so my dad passing away and, and my wife and I took a big brunt of the, of the work that had to be done because mm. my siblings just weren't in the space to do it. And I had no problem being able to my, um, my partner to Aaron, he said, brother, I got your back. He said, you take the time you need. I'll yeah. work with the client. I'll do what we need to do. You just tell me how much time you need. I've got you. Yeah. And to know when you have someone that supports you like that, that that's the other thing. And and years ago, I wouldn't have even dreamed of having a partner. Mm. It would have been all of a sudden I would have now just fought my way through. I'll have to take care of business and, you know, you know, more, you know, you grieve dad and, and take care of all that. But having that partner that just said, look, I've got your back. And because of him, we've now even partnered with a company where we're both not only shareholders, but we're on the board of directors that in the next five years, we're looking for a multi-billion dollar exit oh, because nice. we're now part of a bigger team that has, we have 13 divisions in this, in this company that we can, we'll build it all together for that huge valuation because we all have exit strategy. It's not like we're going to build this and do it for the rest of our lives. It's we're going to build it so that a big company is going to come and go like what you're doing. Let's offer you a bit of money and we'll stay on advisors. It'll still be our intellectual property. And to do that on our own, forget about it. Just to, even us to do it together, forget about it. But now we're part of a bigger, bigger vision. Yeah. And how did we attract that? It started with us working on us, then working together, which we ended up meeting other people. And they went, we need you too. Hmm. And they courted me for over a year to get me to come on and be on their board of directors. Wow. And I'll tell you. I attracted it. I didn't sit there and go, oh my goodness, oh my goodness. Oh, what am I going to do? What am I? And that's the energy most people put in. Yeah. I'd rather you attract than repel. Yeah. Like language is very important. And like, yeah, 
Uh, it, it comes to like for me, it's the simplest strategy that I have that getting a car spot in the front of the shopping center is and is the words that I use with myself is like I always find a car spot at the front of the shopping center rather than yeah. where am I going to find a Rockstar spot? Rockstar parking. <laughs> yeah. yeah, my wife likes that. When we're driving somewhere, we're like Rockstar parking, Rockstar parking, <laughs> and we get the best parking spot. Yeah, <laughs> and people go, well, that's just that's just way out there. Great for you, it is. For me, it works. Yeah. So I'm going to keep doing it. <laughs> but yeah, the other thing as well as you're saying with working with others as well, I guess is when you have your days that you're down, yeah, you've always got someone to help you keep accountable so you complete the tasks that you need because, you know, we're always not going to have the best days. You know, we're going to have some down days, but I guess, you know, working with a team, you know, is, you know, allows you to give you that little bit of extra oomph or, like I said, accountability so you get those yeah. tasks done, yeah? Yep. yep. And, and we could get on our morning call and one of us isn't feeling the best, but next thing you know, we're both laughing. Our Both of our energies are up. And in, and several times, like, brother, I needed that. Thank you. And, 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 and again, our wives think is that it should be illegal for us to get the <laughs> kind of money we make having so much fun. Yeah. But that's what we want to inspire others is that we're showing you mm. what can, is possible with balance. Very yeah. seldom do either of us um, work on the weekends together. Mm. Now, yeah. the only exception is if I'm doing a, a training where it's a weekend training. Mm. But very seldom, it, the weekends, that's family time for both of us. Uh, and our clients know that. Yeah. We set that as a, a context because we'll give a lot to our clients. There's a reason we can, um, we can command the prices we do mm. because we deliver. Yeah. But we also make sure our clients know that we're not going to give everything to the detriment of ourselves. We've done that road. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. We're going to give you amazingness because we're taking care of ourselves and our families, which yeah. allows us to be more present when we're with them. And that's where the, you know, the nuggets of gold come in for them. Uh, one of our clients, we were just on a call with them and I, I love the kind of client that just, you give them something and they implement it. Mm. And, and you know, he signed a, a very lucrative contract with us, pays us monthly and we said, okay, let's set up weekly calls. Let's set up this and this. We'll help you here and here. And he goes, no, no, I've got this and this covered. He says, I just want to call you and know I can reach out and connect when I need you. Yeah. Done. And so all of a sudden, his assistant will reach out to ours. He'll book a time. And he says, okay, I've got a three-day training coming up. And we taught him how to gamify it to, instead of just being data, how to make fun and, and, and really put some processes in. And so last week, we got on a call with him. How did your weekend go? And he's like, Oh my God. He said, even students that have done my three day training a few times said this was the best one they've ever been at. He said, I didn't even have to offer. He said, I, I was thinking of doing, I'm doing a mastermind, a very expensive mastermind coming up next year. He said, I have eight spots left or nine spots. I had nine spots in total. He said, I just mentioned it near the end. He said, in eight minutes, all nine spots were bought. He said, now, I have to actually, I'm going to rent a castle so I can bring more people and we're going to make it an even greater experience. He said, what you guys gave me in that last call, he says, I've now monetized way more than I ever dreamed. And that was, you know, because he, we set a context of here's what we're here to do for you and we're going to help you, but you've still got to be the person to implement it because yeah. it doesn't do any good. If I sit there and go, Neil, do this and do this and do this and you go, oh, awesome. Mm. And then you leave and you don't do jack with it <laughs> yeah. Im implement like as they say is like yeah knowledge is key but it's only there's only a value if you apply it if you don't apply it it's absolutely useless um yep. and that's but, the difference between successful people and non-successful yeah non-successful yeah. people they know a lot but yeah. they haven't done anything yeah well you know what blows me in mind about harv right is that I've listened to the 2006 um, Guerrilla Marketing. I think it's called Guerrilla Business yep. School. Guerrilla Business. And Intensive. he lays yep. out in there what he planned to work towards to achieve with his course material. Not to, not to mention or forget that the amount of times I've heard you, your name being referenced in all of his, you know, um, sale, what's it, Seminar of the Century or yeah, Seminar, Guerrilla yep. Business School. <laughs> you know, you always hear your name getting dropped and I'm like, yeah, I've got to get this guy on. But um, yeah, the fact was in Guerrilla Business School, he, he says um, that he wants to have people teach his courses in different languages around the world. 
And that's what's being done now with the Quantum Leap, which is pretty much those things. And now he's gone on to do other things as well. And he still basically teaches the same material but in a different method. But um, yep. just what, what like – what impresses impresses upon me that, you know, if he had told many people about this sort of stuff back in the day that he was going to do this, I think some people would have said he's crazy. Some people would have called him a con artist and so forth. But, you know, but 20 years on, he's living the life he wants to live and he's still impacting people's lives through yourself. So, like... Yeah, and, that, and, and look, I'll give you, I'll give you something because here's what I want your audience to understand too. If you look at how did T. Harv Ecker start, yeah, it was in his basement yeah. with eight people that he had to promise to make him lunch and he'd pay them to come and learn from him. Oh, wow. See, yeah. People think that I can never do what he's done. Mm. Robert, I can never do what you've done. Yeah, yeah you can. We, do you think I started having taught half a million students in live trainings all around the world? No. Did you, uh, and I don't know if you realize this, Neil, but did you know at one point I was Harv's personal assistant? Really? So at events, I was, I was, if he needed his shirt pressed, I'd do it. I was getting all of his meals. I, was, I would have to sit at the back of the room and watch him so carefully that if he even just looked at me and went like this, I'd have to be up there. I had to watch him because I had to make sure that everything was perfect on his stage. Because for me, what's one of the greatest ways to learn? is just be into that energy. And I'd asked him because, and I want to dispel a lot of things for your audience here. Yeah. I'd asked him at one point when I was still a student of his, I said, would you be my mentor? Yeah. And we had just finished doing an evening. My wife and I did volunteer. We were there. We'd helped him with the evening. We're now sitting down because we now, he knows us. We get to know us really well. And we're having a drink after doing this presentation. And I had been nervous about asking them this question. <laughs> it was just ripping me apart. Mm. I was just like, I can't ask my wife, ask him. I can't ask, ask him. I can't ask, just ask him. <laughs> right? <laughs> He's just going through this. Yeah. And I finally, we're sitting down and I go, Harv, there's a question I want to ask you. He goes, what is it? I said, would you mentor me? Mm. And he kind of pauses for a couple moments and he goes, no. Really? He says, I don't have time to do one-on-one -on -one mentoring. Mm. And if I did, it probably cost you at least a million dollars. Wow. And Neil, I got pissed. Oh, I really? was pissed. Yeah. By this time, my wife and I had been volunteering full on for about over a year, mm. where we were actually volunteering at up to 38 events a year. Because mm. once we became financially free, we just traveled and volunteered everywhere with Harv to you know, yeah. be ingrained in it. And yeah. I was pissed. And I was courteous to him. Okay, I appreciate you know That makes sense. Okay. And we got back to our hotel room, and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm just <laughs> venting. Yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm not a happy man. Mm. And my wife's listening to me and she finally, I calmed down and she finally looked at me and she goes, are you done? I'm like, what do you mean? Am I done? And she goes, oh, you're not done. Get it out. <laughs> and you so were... I just bent even more. And I'm finally, I'm like, just, and she goes, are you done? And I said, yeah, I'm done. She goes, because one of the things I said is we're never volunteering again. How was... dare he? Right. You would have been my... mad bitter. You would have been really bitter about that. Yeah. Oh, I was really bitter. And my wife looked at me and she says, first of all, wrong answer. And I'm like, what do you mean wrong answer? Hmm. She goes, well, you said we're not volunteering anymore. She goes, that's the wrong answer. We're going to volunteer more. <laughs> I'm looking at my wife like she's wow. awful. I'm like, what do you mean we're going to volunteer more? She goes, well, let me ask you a question. She says, if I understand this correctly, you asked Harvard a question. He answered in speaking his truth and you can't handle it. <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, right. <laughs> he spoke his truth mm. and she goes, and by the way, do we have a million dollars to spend right now? I'm like, well, no. She goes, then what are you so bitter about? Why are you bitching and complaining? She goes, is there other ways of doing it? And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes, well, when we volunteer, do you learn a lot from Harvard? I'm like, yeah. She goes, so let's volunteer more. Mm. there's another way to get him to mentor you. Yeah. And it was after that, because we were showing up so much, they made me his personal assistant where now, yeah, Neil, I'm out the back of the room. I'm not allowed to do anything, but watch him. Yeah. Every move, every voice tone, every mannerism. That became the greatest training I ever could have received as a trainer. Because mm. all of a sudden one day when he put me on stage to help him for five minutes, 
Yeah. And this is where I say five minutes can change your life because out of necessity, he called me aside one day and said, Robert, I need you to go on stage for five minutes and do this and this and this. Can you handle it? On the outside, I'm going, yeah. On the inside, I'm like, ah! <laughs> Yeah, and, and, you know, it comes to what Richard Branson says. Say yes and figure out later. Mm. I said yes, and because I did that five minutes, we broke the mold. Next thing you know, I'm doing warm ups for him. Next thing you know, he's sharing data. Next thing you know, I'm the first person ever to train one of his courses other than him, mm. and he's not even in the city. Yeah. I had 1,200 students in Los Angeles, June of 2004. Nervous mm. wreck, but I still pulled it off. And all of a sudden, that's the day that his company exploded because on his own. And again, remember what we talked about earlier, yeah. quit trying to do it on your own mm. on his own. He could do 38 events a year maximum because he had to be at every one. But mm. the moment I showed someone else could teach his material other than him over the next three years, we went up to over 200 events around North America a year. Yeah. 2007 TR Rector and I fly for the first time outside of North America. We go to Singapore. We have six, thousand students in the audience his largest audience ever for a three-day training and it also where are we today his materials taught all over the world well, because yeah. he quit trying to do it on his own yeah no well that's yeah that's the, the bit to like yeah once yeah he put some faith in you to deliver he was able to do more with himself and um yeah basically he grew from there yeah like and the thing is your persistence, yeah? Like, yeah, he didn't say he'll be your mentor, but, you know, as long as you step, still kept being persistent, being there, yeah, you didn't stop you from talking to him and asking him the occasional question, which is all you really oh, need oh. from a mentor. Yeah, and, and often we're sitting down having meals together and, and just in our general conversation, he's like, do you know why I did this? This is why I did this. And this is why it's important to have great people in your, in your life because had it been left to me, I would have been pissed off. I would have walked away. But thank God my wife said no. Yeah. My wife saw something I wasn't seeing. And again, that's another thing that people tend to do. And I'm speaking from experience. Is we think that we have to have all the answers. We can't rely on someone else. And you need those people in your, in your life to hold you to that higher standard. Yeah. To tell you when you're full of crap. To mm. tell you when you're off track. And to help you brainstorm and mastermind ways to get around it. Because had I not gone through that journey... Because if you think about it, the moment I started training, we showed someone else could. I was also now developing a dozen trainers behind me. Wow, yeah. And so, and, and here's three critical keys for your audience. If you want to do good at something and learn it really well, especially if it's something you're passionate about and you want to make money, yep. first you learn. Learn from the best. Learn however you can. Volunteer. Show up. Be there. Be willing to pay for the price. Then do it. Get in there. Do it. Practice it. The biggest issue, I've trained thousands of trainers around the world. And the number one issue, they don't practice. Mm. Well, I've got the knowledge now. Uh, when I get a booking, I'll go and do it. No, what are you doing behind the scenes? Are yeah. you actually practicing? You know, and here's my big advice to your audience. Because people go, Robert, how do I do what you do? You've now taught for over 20 years. You've now taught half a million in live on-stage training, multi-day training. You've now done over $100 million in sales from the stage. How do I do what you do? Here's my answer. If you want to do what I do, do what I do behind the scenes. Yeah. Because think like you, Neil. Yeah. Is this the first time you just hop on camera and like, okay, everything's going to work. I'm <laughs> going to do an interview. Or is there prep that you do behind the scenes? Yeah, there definitely is. There's, there's a little bit of prep that goes into doing an episode just so I'm prepared basically so I don't have that pressure come down on me um, and I don't get no anxiety or anything because yeah. there's enough nervousness when I get behind the camera that I don't need to be unprepared while doing it, you know what I mean? Because otherwise I will just fall exactly. apart. Exactly. Um, and, and, and of course, as soon as we're done the interview, you don't have to do anything else with this episode, right? Nothing. It's all perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Not quite, but I still got some editing to do. But, um, you know, that's, exactly. that's, the, that's the passion of what I do. I always believe, right, you know, this for me from doing my podcast, there's three things I've learned if you want to succeed in anything. And that is one, to find a mentor that has, or has already achieved what you want to achieve. Okay. Surround yourself around like minded people. As, you, as the saying goes, show me your friends, I'll show you your future. 
And then number yep. three is enjoy the journey. Don't push yes. yourself because yes. you will burn yourself <laughs> out and you won't end up doing it and you'll find something else that's more safe to do, that's more comfortable to do when really, yep. you know, you're already comfortable with your passion but because you've pushed yourself, the pain has been so great that you'll go on to something else that's easier. So always believe, right. yeah, enjoy the journey. Because a lot of people so many times want to do something and they put so much pressure on themselves and it just never happens in the end. You know? Oh, they, and, they, and, then, and then they wonder why they quit and they give up on themselves. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. And that's why when I said the learn and then the do, the third part is then to teach. Yeah. Because when you teach something, you ingrain it on a deeper level. Mm. And, and that is the key is you've really got to be – Willing to, and now how many people can you help by you teaching it? And yeah. the benefit is you're getting better yourself. And, and, you know, so, and I definitely was being facetious and I was, you know, joking around saying, you know, that you don't have to do anything because that's the biggest pe thing people don't realize is you've got to be willing to put that work in. Mm. The boring as hell, monotonous, behind the scenes stuff that people don't see. But if you're not doing it, you can't be as flawless. Or, well, I won't say flawless because we still all make mistakes. Mm. And I want people to understand that. On stage, I make mistakes like crazy. Yeah. I just don't, I got used to not beating myself up over it anymore. Yeah. And, and if I may, Neil, something that you said on your three steps, can I make one little adjustment for you that for a it. mentor of mine did for me yes. just two years ago that changed my life? Yeah. Right? Because like you, I was a big believer. Surround yourself with like-minded people. Hmm. very important. And my mentor said to me, he said, Robert, let me ask you a question. If you're surrounding yourself with like-minded people, and that means some of the people around you are complainers, because like, you're like-minded, what is that going to make you? That's, yeah, you don't want to be around that. Like, yeah. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. And I knew he had the answer because I saw the look on his face. I said, okay, what are you suggesting? He said, just one little adjustment. He said, I'd rather you surround yourself with growth-minded people. Yeah. And I asked him, what's the difference? He said, a growth-minded person, they're going to be there to help lift you up when you stumble. They're going to be your greatest cheering squad when you're doing well. But the most important role that they're going to play is they're going to be the people that are willing to have the tough conversations with you when yeah. needed. Yeah. You know, like, Neil, why are you playing smaller than you could? Robert, why are you being a jerk right now? <laughs> they're the ones that are willing to, even if it means you get pissed at them, Mm. They're the ones that are willing to stand in their power and have those conversations with you That's, because that what's going to allow you to grow. If you're just around like-minded people and they happen to be people that bitch and complain and moan all the time, you're just going to be that way that, if you're like-minded. Yeah, I get that. It's like when, when it comes to me with my trading, for example, I like to be around a lot of traders, you know, because if there's something we're not sure about, we can always ask each other. But um, the thing is we stay focused on the task at hand. It could be the same even with a soccer team, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. You know, you guys all – you want to all win the team, uh, win the game, sorry. So the thing is, like, you want to be around those type of people so you can continue, continually push yourself and, like you say, I guess growth is the key word in all that, yeah? Yeah. Well, and, and then even – because I'm always learning, mm. not even – I'd say about six months ago. Mm. My wife sent me a, a video from Facebook. She said, you've got to watch this. And I'm like, what is it? And this guy was talking about his rule of 33. Yeah. And I'm like, rule of 33. She said, just watch it. And it came to the like-minded, growth-minded talk. Yeah. And what he said took me to another paradigm shift. He said, 33% of the people that you surround yourself with make it people that are not as well off as you are. So that you can help lift them, you can help guide them, you can help them have greater lives. Mm. Said thirty three percent of the people that you spend your time with, have it be people that are at the same level as you are. So they appreciate and you can appreciate each other, you can celebrate each other's successes because it's like they understand what you're going through. Yeah. He said and then the other thirty three percent, have it spend your time around the people that have achieved greater things than you did, so that they they can be guiding you. Yeah. And again it was like Wow Damn There's a strategy to it. <laughs> like, yeah, and that just put my world upside down. It was like putting mm. me into Australia, down under. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, you know, so mm. even, even after 20 years of being able to teach all of the world, I'm still learning. Yeah. And I well, want people to get that that's the key. Never stop. 
Mm. I, 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 as much as I'm on stages, I'm learning. Yeah. I'm ingraining. I'm learning from other people, even people that, you know, they may be my client. Oh, you better believe I'm listening for their <laughs> nuggets of gold that they're yeah, going to yeah. teach me. Mm. And so I get paid by them to learn from them too. And I'm like, hey. That's not too bad. <laughs> <laughs> That's all right. So what motivated you like to get into the teaching space? Like what was it that drove you to it? Like um, because, yeah, like you have been doing it for 20 years now. Even though you got burnt out, you were happy to get back on the horse and do it, obviously, in a more controlled manner this time around. But um, yeah. what motivated you to get into the whole teaching space? Well, when, you know, so my wife and I are Domino's Pizza franchisees at the time. Yeah. We're now franchisees for eight years. Mm. And, you know, we, we bought our first store when we were 23, which mm. at the time was the average age of a Domino's Pizza franchisee because you couldn't just buy a store. Yeah. You had to successfully manage a store for at least a year and qualify. Mm. Okay. And so we were franchisees, and, and as we started making better money, we started spending more money because mm. of our habits. And so here we are, eight years into being franchisees. We're now stressed out beyond belief because we're spending way more money than we're earning. Mm. We're now over $150,000 in debt. When someone, as a gift, gave us two tickets to an evening, to go see T.R. Becker for three hours. Yeah, like, and all of a sudden, we, we went to that evening, mm -hmm. changed our life. We immediately spent $600 that we did not have Damn. to sign up to go to his three-day weekend <laughs> yep. because we felt something was about to change. The only reason, because that was three months later, March mm -hmm. 2001, we go to the evening. June of 2001 is when um, the three-day training is. The only reason we showed up to that training was, was to get our money tag. back. <laughs> okay. Oh, uh, was to get our money back. Yeah, yeah. Because we were now sick. We had just finished traveling a little bit. We, our body, our minds knew something was about to change, so it physically made us ill. Yeah. And thank goodness, the the woman that was doing the registration, she knew what was going on. She had witnessed this before, so she didn't try to. Because I was ready for the fight, Neil. I was ready for them to say, "We're not giving you the money back." I was like, "Come <laughs> on, I dare you. Tell me, <laughs> tell me." But instead, she was very nice, and she's just like, "Look, here's what I'm going to suggest." It's going to take me a little bit of time. Why don't you come in until the first break or till lunch and just, you know, watch. By lunchtime, I'll have an answer for you. Mm. Okay. My wife hadn't even come in. She was waiting on the truck. I go walking out. I'm like, honey. <laughs> She's like, really? I'm like, I was a different person back then. You know, I was a different <laughs> person. By lunchtime, we're not feeling sick anymore. Yeah. And the woman comes out and she goes, oh, there you are. You want to talk about your refund? And we're like, get away from us. We don't want a refund. We don't need a refund. We're having too much fun here. Yeah, and yeah. that changed my life. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, we go and we become financially free nine months later. And because we're volunteering so much and in that energy, see, one of the things I'm, I'm, that's probably a greatest gift I've received is I'm much more self-aware. Yeah. And I know I'm a procrastinator. Uh, so one yeah. of the reasons we volunteered so much is I knew left environment stronger than willpower. I knew if yeah. we were out of the energy, I'd go back to my old ways. Yeah. So we volunteered a lot to stay in that energy. And as we were doing that, all of a sudden I just found my passion. I was like, wow, if I could help one person, hmm. one person do what my wife and I had done, go from deep in debt to financially free, it'd make it all worthwhile. That's where my passion started. I would love to, and I often, because Harvard had been looking for a trainer for years. Hmm. But see, because I had been his personal assistant, yeah. I modeled him so exactly, people would tell me they'd close their eyes and they thought it was Harv on the stage because I had his voice tones, his mannerisms, everything. Yeah. See, he was looking for a clone in the beginning. That's mm. what he was looking for. That's why he hadn't found a trainer yet. Yeah. And so because I was watching him so closely at so many events, I found it and moved like T.R. Becker on the stage. Yeah. And we're the same height. He just <laughs> has more hair. Plain <laughs> so what was it? And, and I, just, I found that was my passion. I had uh. to do this. So, yeah, so like being there and just wanting to share, you realize that it was, it's a very fulfilling, you know, it's a really fulfilling feel, feeling when you're actually giving back to someone or giving to someone and yeah. helping them with their own personal growth journey. And the thing is, you would have had some obstacles through your life in your personal growth journey. Um, you do. Yeah, you do. And what are, do. what are some of the things that you do to, Go over those, get over those obstacles. Do you have any strategies or anything like that? Yeah, just the people I surround myself with. Yep, that's it. Just surround uh, yourself. Yeah, with. that's it. Yo, um, that's why I have a great business partners mm. and multiple business partners. You know, because I do different businesses, 
And I have phenomenal business partners who of all are warrior graduates. Okay. Yep. Interesting little concept right there yeah, because yeah. we know we can speak the same language and we can mm. call each other on our integrity. If we fall out of it, uh, you know, as an example, when I first signed a contract with Harv to be his very first trainer, yeah. here was our contract. <laughs> yeah. We, we had a discussion of what we'd like it to look like. We shook hands and mm. that was it. And yep. if either of us would, you know, strayed a little bit from what we, our agreement was, all we had to do is remind the other person. It was like, that's right. Yep. I did agree to that. I apologize. We'll make the adjustment. And, and for the first two years, that's the only contract I had. The only re- reason we went to paper contract is because now I've been developing dozens of trainers and we needed a system yep. for everybody. But today, so I, I surround myself with other people who've done warrior Mm. Because I know I can speak the language of integrity to them. I can yeah. call them on their crap. They can call me on my crap. And we have that understanding. Wow. So do you have many challenges with dealing with people like, you know, having people accountable and stuff like that? Because talking about the warrior thing, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are like, yeah, yeah, yeah. They're all on the Kool-Aid. And then when, when the show's over, it's a different story. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And that's where context comes in. Mm. holding your boundaries and because I used to set boundaries, but I'd let people push them like crazy. Yeah. And now I do it without emotion. It's not, I don't all of a sudden sit there ah, 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 and get upset. It's just like, you know what? Um, this was the agreement we made. Yep. If that doesn't work for you, I'm sorry. It doesn't work for me because this is non-negotiable. And so I'm willing to, because here's the thing is, is I quit a long time ago. I quit doing things for money, Neil. Yeah. I do them because I love it. Yeah. But then money becomes a beautiful side effect, a beautiful yeah. benefit. Yeah. And so um, when I took the three and a half years off, because I was so burnt out, the moment I wasn't TR Vector's right-hand person, all these people were bombarding me. Come train with us. We've been wanting to work with you. And I'd, I'd say, no, I need a year off. Hmm. And I found who my true friends were because my true friends respected that. Yeah. The people who, you know, that didn't respect it, they'd be like trying to convince me. And I'd finally say, stop. Obviously, you don't know me better than that, than you think Mm. you do. If you think I'm going to just do something for the money, wrong answer. So please don't contact me anymore. Mm. You obviously aren't getting the message that I'm taking time off. Yeah. And you so a person has to hold them, their own context, their own boundaries, because it's your responsibility whether you let people push them or not. No one else is. They're going to test. The world's going to test you. Yeah, And so if you get pissed off that, well, they, I did it because they made me. No, you had the choice. Yeah, you yeah. had the choice and you made the decision. And it's taken, it's a, it's a practice I'm still in. Because again, don't think I'm any better than anybody else. Yeah. I'm, I'm just, I'm an aerodynamic dude. <laughs> and I make mistakes. Like, ask my wife, she'll tell you, I make mistakes. Lots of them. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm human. So were you a bit of a pleaser beforehand? Because like... I tell you oh. what, like, I'm a bit of a people pleaser and it's like, it's hard to turn people down and you feel like you're going to lose friends and then it's like, yep. you start to question and get doubt and like, what do you do in those situations? I was a gold medal people pleaser. <laughs> I was a gold medalist. If there was an Olympic sport called people pleasing and I became like that little dog, especially if I respected you and I wanted to, to be your friend, I'd be like, oh, please, 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 let me, and it'd be like, get away from me, you freak. Because I'd be overdoing it. Yeah. And I'm sure you've met people like that. Yeah. Um, so the moment I realized, here's who I am. Yeah. This is me. Yeah. Either you like me for who I am or you don't. Mm. If you like me for who I am, that's awesome. If you don't like me for who I am, that's awesome. Mm. Because the moment I quit trying to please everybody, I'm still blown away today, Neil. Yeah the people that are attracted to my energy because they wanted to know me for me, not who they think I can be because I'm trying to be someone else. And I, it's something I, and I'll tell your audience this, please hear my words on this. The greatest gift that any of you can give the world is to be your authentic self, no matter what that looks like. If you're, if you're authentically just a jerk, be authentically a jerk because Mm -hmm. then the people who like jerks, will show up to want to be friends with you. You're yeah. not going to have to sit there and people all of a sudden be shocked like, oh, who are you? I don't remember you being like that. 
Mm. So just be yourself. It's the greatest gift you can give this planet. Yeah. So do you have any golden rules that you live by for 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 yourself in a day to day life? And like, I guess you know how these have uh, contributed to your success. I uh, just for me, it's have fun. Have fun. Life's too short not to have fun. Mm. And so that guides my decisions. There, hey, even when I'm have it's hard work. I find a way to enjoy it. Yeah. Um, uh, yesterday, my wife and I this weekend, we were helping um, one of my brother-in-laws. They're getting ready to sell, sell their house. So we were helping install a toilet, helping install tap work. I'm down on my knees in cabinets. I'm in pain because of my back surgery. But you know what? They've helped us so much. We help them. It's, it's a win-win situation. And I'm not going to sit there and, and get bitchy about it. Mm. They asked for help and we're like, we're there. And we had fun with it. We had music on. We were um, just having good conversations. It wasn't yelling at each other. See, life's too short not to have fun. Yeah. And yet people think that, and people, oh, Robert, don't you take anything seriously? Yeah, I take having fun serious. <laughs> I like that one. <laughs> and, and guess what? Yeah. I think by a lot of people's standards, I have a pretty good life that a lot of people would like to have. Mm, so if I can have do. fun and have this life, hmm, you think you can? Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and, uh, so if you could go back and tell, talk to your younger self, what would you say? Or are you going to just tell me, just have fun? Because that's like everyone no, has those epiphanies no. where like, I wish I could go back 20 years and tell him. I, I struggled with this question for a long time. Mm. You know, I struggled with it because what I realized is if I could go back to my younger self, I would just tell myself, just keep doing what you're doing. Really? Keeping you. Mm. Because I wouldn't want to, even my toughest times, you know, before my first back surgery, I'm in bed, cannot move for over six weeks. And, you know, nothing is more um, humbling than when someone has to wipe your ass because you can't. Yeah, yeah. And, I, and they go, well, wouldn't you want to get rid of that time? And I'm like, no, what it taught me, how to be humble in that. Oh, my God. Why would I change that? Yeah, yeah, everything yeah. I've gone through, the good, the bad, the ugly, has made me who I am today. So that's why I struggled with that question because it's like, oh, what? You know, big revelation can I give to myself to make sure I was more successful in the future? And, and it's like, but how many lessons would I have missed if I tried to shortcut? Yeah. Huh. So my advice to myself would be just keep being you and and just keep going forward. Just roll with the punches, I guess. And um, yeah, there'll be lessons yeah. wherever wherever you go, I guess. And these are the things that really sculpt you for your future, you know? is that That's right. That's what you're saying, yeah? Yeah, because... Because look at how many people with their kids tried to get them to avoid everything they went through that was a hardship. And then also they wonder why their kids are spoiled or their kids are unappreciative or their kids are like difficult to deal with. Mm. Let them have their own journey. Yeah. Guide Fair them, yep. but let them have their own experiences. Don't mm. try to make them, you know, you try to make them something else and then you're pissed off when they become something else. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, I, I get that. Yeah. Like I'm trying to do that with my daughter. Like, Try not to be too much of a helicopter parent, you know. You yeah. can share some lessons, but you got to still let them make their own mistakes because otherwise they're not going to learn from it. And I guess like me, as a child, I was spoiled a lot. So, you know, I expected a lot more things just to come more freely and easier as I got older. But it was a bit of a shock when my parents sort of just, you know, cut the rope or whatever you want to say, you know. Um, yep. Yeah pushed me out the nest, you know, having to deal with my own responsibilities, especially when I first got my mobile phone and I think I could go spend it, you know, making calls here and there and then getting these large bills. They weren't there to, to pick up the, the pieces. I had to do that. And yep. so I basically had had to change and become an adult and grow up. So, you know. Um, and every generation goes through their differences. Yeah. You know, my wife being the youngest of, of five, her mm. mom who was pregnant, mm. With my wife's older sister, when yeah. she was fourteen years old, wow. because back then that was a common thing, mm. and so all of a sudden, you know, it's like my um, my mother in law. She had she was a grandmother by the time she was thirty one, wow. and so all of a sudden, you know, one of their their in their family was when you turned sixteen, the present you got from your from their mom yeah. was a set of luggage because <laughs> that was your um, hint. It's time to move out. Wow. Who would even think of having their kids move out at 16 now? My no wife one. finished grade 12 
yeah. when we moved in together. She did yeah. her last year of high school. We're already living together. So wow. shh, don't tell anybody we lived in Sin Neil. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm married yet. <laughs> I've been very blessed. I, you know, I've, I've known my wife since we were 13. Yeah. We started dating when we were 16, and we got married when we were 19. And we just celebrated 33 years of marriage in this past June. So, well, what's the, what's the secret? Because I tell you what, you guys have been together for so long. There's got to be a secret to it, you know? What is it? Um, we're our own, we're our unique people. Mm. Um, we we're gonna fight. Yep. We're gonna love. Mm. We're not gonna be happy. We're gonna be happy. It it's life. Yeah. But we're committed to each other. Mm. We're like. committed, and that's probably the biggest thing. You know, I, I remember a, a meme I saw on Facebook years ago that just summed it up. It was a, a grandmother and a granddaughter in rocking chairs on the front porch of the house, and the granddaughter asked the grandmother, "says Grandma." how is it that you and grandpa have been together for so long? And she said, because dear, in our day, when something's broke, you fix it. You didn't just give up and walk away. That's it. And yeah. it's just my perception, Neil, is that, mm. you know, cause there are relationships that are not meant, you know, mm. it, you need a person needs to walk away. But I just think there's too many situations now days where people just give up too easily That's because true. they don't like it. It's not <laughs> what they wanted. Yeah. That's life. Yeah, I still go through the ups and the downs and the goods and the bad. Mm. But you know what? It's made me who I am today. And yeah, because yeah. I've been willing to not give up, and again, there's people in my corner when I've wanted to give up going, no. Yeah. And I, I've been pissed and I'm like, may yell and scream at them, but they're, they hold their power and they're like, no, you're not giving up. You committed to this. You're following through. And thank goodness they helped me that way. Yeah, no, that's people, people's support around you is important. And like you said earlier, is that don't be afraid to ask. Um, a lot of people, they don't, they, they will bitch and complain, yep. but they yep. won't go out and ask for support, ask for a little bit of guidance because I don't know, maybe yep. it's humiliating, but then that's where it comes back to being it's, humble. It's the way you've been, yeah, it's the way you've been taught and raised. And it, most people have been taught that. Showing any kind of vulnerability is a weakness. Yeah. But I'm just going to come from my perspective. Vulnerability is one of the greatest strengths I believe anybody could have. Yeah. One of the greatest strengths. Because when you're willing to be vulnerable and say, I do need some assistance, mm. then that opens the space to allow people to then assist you. Yeah. And, not, and, and this is where, like, when you talk about, say, true love versus what's called needy love. Yeah. So many people fall in love with someone or in a relationship with someone because what that person provides for them, what yeah. they need from them. Yeah. And that, that, that's a vol becomes volatile because the yeah. moment you perceive that person's not giving you what you thought you needed from them anymore, all of a sudden that's when it's like, and you're gone. Yeah. But imagine being in relationships, business and personal, mm. where you appreciate and love the person for who they are, yeah. not what they contribute to you. For who they are, that's the, those are the relationships I look for. I want the relationships with people that, and that's why you know a lot of times some of my greatest business partners become people I had originally taught or I had learned from. Because when we live in that space, and again, I'm never going to say it's easy. It takes work. It takes correction. Yeah. It takes you know just trudging through the muck sometimes. Yeah. But when you real, even if you have a severe fallout you can then eventually repair it. Yeah. Hey, T.R. Becker and I had a major fallout when I stepped back and retired. Yeah. But then we were able to repair. Mm. So and you, so it's not, every journey is going to be perfect all the way through. No, they have their ups and downs. So it's like really you, you, you're looking for relationships based on character rather than what they can bring to the table. Is that right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It, uh, I, I would sit there and ra I'd rather deal with someone that maybe they're not the strongest in things I think I need, but they, they've got a great attitude. They've got a great personality. They are authentic. I know I can rely on them. I know they're trustworthy. Mm. And they, I, I'll, I'll give you an example of that, you know, my first virtual assistant. Yeah. Oh my goodness. Cause again, I struggle to struggle. I, I'm telling people to have you should have an assistant. And also I went to a, a company and they went through an interview process. And um, saying, you know, I don't even know what I need. And they're like, well, what about this? What about this? Yeah, I do need someone to help me with social media. I need to. And all of a sudden, they set up these interviews. 
And I get on this first one and I'm, you know, they're talking about what I need and all this. And I, and, uh, I came up to a part where they said, well, she said to me, well, I would probably would want some pictures of you on stage in that. I said, well, I've got hundreds of pictures, but they've all got branding behind me and, and stuff that's not mm. mine. I said, but I have been told I could probably either take myself out of the picture or remove the background. And she looked at me, she goes, yeah, that's easy. And I'm just like, of course it is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because for her, this is what she's doing day in and out, day out. Yeah. And she has become such a rock star. She's taken so much weight off my shoulders that I've had several of our clients go, can we steal Melissa? Could you come work for us? <laughs> and we're like, hell no. <laughs> I love that. Uh, that's awesome. And then what do we do? And here's mm. the key for your, your listeners. We treat her amazing. Mm. It's not you're an underling, you're just an employee. And one of the greatest days, I think, for me was when um, it came to, you know, what do you think, you know, what do you think you're worth? And she's like, well, I'd like to get this. And, and my business partner and I went, nope, that's too little. We're going to give you more. We're going to double you, what you think you are worth. And all mm. of a sudden she's like, pardon me. And we said, that's what you're worth to us. So rewrite this contract, send it with the, these numbers. Oh, and there's going to be other ways we recognize you. And thank you. And she's like, really? And we're like, yeah. See, because when you can help other people own their value as well, because how many years have we been hit down, knocked down, knocked down by others telling us we're not good? Mm. Imagine if you are out there to uplift people, to show them that they're worth, to help them live that authentic self. How much greater would this world be? Yeah, yeah. And be happier too, you know, um, because like, yeah, yep. and you, when you get happier people, the, the productivity is also better as well. No, really? <laughs> isn't, that, isn't that amazing how that happens? Yeah. <laughs> Not many yeah. people think about it. They're more interested in saving money in their pocket and then they expect yep. to get the same work, if not better. And it's like, yeah, if you give them a little bit more, they'll be happy to jump when you say jump, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. In our Domino's Pizza days, when we interview people, we would sit there in the interview and say, our number one rule is you've got to have fun. Yeah, Because when we're making 100 or more pizzas an hour from scratch, it gets stressful. So yeah. if you're not willing to have fun, if you come in with a bad attitude because you're having a bad day, we'll send you home. Yeah. If that oh, happens wow. more than once, we may look at letting you go. Mm. Because one person can infect the whole um, team. So if we're sitting there and one person's in a bad mood, well, all of a sudden everybody's in a bad mood. And is that right? No. no. So that was our number one rule is, we are here to have fun. We work as a team. And so that we were always having practical jokes because also now when you're making those busy, busy hours, people are able to go, okay, let's get it done. We'll get through this together as a team. Instead of like, it's like, wow, big difference in energy. So are you still in the, the Domino's game? Like, do you treat uh, franchises like uh, passive income vehicles? We could have, but we chose to, um, when we got out of Domino's Pizza 20, actually 21 years ago already, <laughs> we sold our last store. Yeah. Um, looking at it, we learned so much from Domino's Pizza. Would mm. I do that type of business again? No, unless I was doing it in a way where it was, um, I owned a number of stores, like mm. lots of stores where everything was systemized and it was a passive income for me. Yeah. And when we left Domino's, we actually, when we sold the last store, um, interesting enough, Nobody wanted it because where it was located, you couldn't um, grow or develop around there. And so no one wanted because they'd become like one store franchisee. Yeah. And then, and we didn't realize we were putting out the, in, um, the energy that no one would want it. No one would want it. All of a sudden, when we started learning and we, um, all of a sudden we started growing and we got to retirement and, you know, and real close, my wife and I went, wow, the store systemized. We have a full management team in there. We're not having to spend much time. We'll keep it as a passive income, mm. and we're happy. But if someone wants to come and offer us a proper price, we'll sell it for yeah. the right price. And all of a sudden, from nobody wanting it, three people wanted it. Wow. Three people came to us and were going, we'd like this store. And we sold a store a year earlier under duress, under stress, frustration, and, and headache, and for a lower price than what we wanted. And it was us. We had to take ownership. We allowed them to treat us that way. Yeah. So when... The, Three people approached us. We went to the first young guy who's now qualified and we said, look, here's the deal. Here's the price. 
non-negotiable. Mm. We, you know, here's here's the possession date, non-negotiable. We will tell you the good. We will tell you the bad. We will tell you the ugly. As long as you live up to your end of the deal, we'll live up to ours, and everything will go smooth. Mm. However, the moment you don't live up to yours, no hard feelings. Our deal's done. We'll go to the second person. See, you came to us first, so we'll go to you first. And we got an agreement. Are you clear? Mm. And he was like, absolutely. Everything was going perfect, Neil, until he had to put down a $5,000 non-refundable deposit check. Mm. And he didn't show up with the check. And now, were we upset? Were we pissed? Yes. Because we had spent a couple months putting this together, but we had to hold to it, you know, what we said. So Mm. we phoned him up. We said, what's going on? Well, well, well. And at that moment, we could have broke our boundary and tried to convince him. Mm. But we said, you know what? Then appreciate your time. You know, we were clear and you didn't live up to the deal. So our deal's done and we're going to go on to the next person. You know, appreciate your time. And we hung up the phone. And of course, my wife and I are like, ah, right? (laughs) Frustrated. Mm. Three minutes later, he called back and he goes, you know what? I'm on my way. And Neil here, we had a choice at this moment. Yeah. And it, had it been me by myself, yeah. I would have just gone, Woo, great, get down here, get some money. But my wife went, No. And he's like, What do you mean, no? She goes, Have we not been clear? We've told you all the good, all the bad, everything. Yes. We've told you everything. We've showed you everything. Yes. And you just didn't live up. And we were very clear. Yeah. She goes, So if you still wanted the deal, the price for the store just went up $5,000. <laughs> yeah. You have three hours to decide if you still want it or not before we go to the next person. And we hung up the phone. And I'm like... Wow. That's power. <laughs> That's amazing. Because I don't know if it felt right. Mm. right? <laughs> and we're both like, oh my God. And he, three minutes later, he calls back. He goes, I agree to the new terms. I'm on my way with a check. Wow. Everything went smooth. That's and all amazing. of a sudden, we look back and we go, January 2001, when we sold our first store, stressed out beyond belief, full of anger, Ended up financing almost the whole purchase because he didn't pay for, you know, get a loan. We ended up, you know, financing it to April 2002. All of a sudden, everything was a totally different energy. Got the price we wanted. Got everything the way we wanted. Possession date and all that. What was the difference? Oh, yeah. It was us. us. Yeah. We were the difference there. So. Wow. So, look, I've got to wrap this up, like. We've been going for over an hour now, and I really enjoyed having. Yeah, I think a chat we could probably you. talk for a long time. Right? <laughs> I think so, <laughs> but just one one question that's been rattling my head, um, and I really want to ask you, and I hope you can answer it for me. Um, I don't mean to intrude. Well, the pressure, the oh, pressure, you <laughs> the, So you went from um, you know in nine months from 150k down to zero. How did you do it? And what are some passive income vehicles that you do now have that helps you drive you forward? Because I'll tell you what, I've been thinking about it so much and I was like, I've got to ask this question. See, so you made a misconception that most people did. Yeah. Because what did you just say? In nine months, how did you go from 150K in debt to zero? Yeah. I never said I did. You retired. I said I went from over $150,000 in debt to being financially free. Free, yeah. And if you remember the, the, the equation of financial freedom, financial freedom is when your passive income is greater than your expenses. Yeah. See, we had a lot of expenses and we didn't know what passive income was. Mm. So there's no way we could have financial freedom. And that's yeah. why we were stressed out. Because if we didn't earn enough to service those debts, we kept going further and further behind. Mm. But the first thing we did is we massively sat down and had the hard discussion. What don't we need right now? That if we were to let it go, sure, we may want it, but if we were to sell it or, you know, return it or whatever to reduce our expenses, what are we willing to let go of right now? And we had a hard conversation. And my wife and I started, you know, we sold off one of our cars because we had two cars because successful people have two cars. And so we only ever used one at a time. We were both in the store together, but we had two cars because that's what successful people do. So we sold a car and got rid of that expense. Mm -hmm. We had a boat. Because, hey, we lived at a lake. We should go boating. We couldn't go boating because our busy season was boating season. So our boat sat in the driveway with all the expenses. So we sold the boat. Yeah. And we dramatically simplified our life. At the same time, we started learning about passive income. Mm. And it was in the nine months the two surpassed. Now, we barely had enough passive income 
to take care of our current expenses, including part of the debt we still had of that 150000 We were mm-hmm. still able to service it. So now we are technically financially free, Yeah, plain and simple. And so we weren't wealthy. We were financially free. Yeah. But here's the magic that we never expected, Neil, that happened. Yeah. The moment we were financially free, we went from having to work 50, 60, 70 or more hours a week earning a living. We had all that time freed up now. Yeah. And if I was to go to you and say, I'm your bald-headed genie, I'm going <laughs> to grant you the wish, and I'm going to give you 40, 50, 60 hours more a week to do with whatever you want. Neil, do you think of some things that you could probably do with that extra time? Yeah, I could probably yeah. either spend time with family or, you know, I guess work on ideas right? to create other business yeah. ventures. So now with this time freedom, yep. we made a commitment to ourselves to take 10 hours a week. We were just given 40, 50, 60, 70 more hours a week extra because mm. we didn't have to work anymore. So we said, let's take 10 of those hours and focus on creating our financial freedom create or creating our wealth. Yeah. And also because we had the time freedom, now to focus on creating the wealth, creating wealth became so much easier. So yeah. here's my suggestion to people. Don't try to figure out what the next greatest passive income. Don't think about the next greatest, what's going to make me the most money. Mm. Simplify your life. Find one or two things that you enjoy that you could, and find a way to make a passive income with them so you get yourself financially free. Mm. Once you've got the time freedom, now focus on creating wealth because it'll be a lot less stressful Yeah. because most people, they try to create wealth while they're already working 50, 60, 70, 80 hours a, a week and they're stressed out beyond belief because they can't make ends meet. Mm. Get that taken care of first by making the hard decisions if needed. Get the financial freedom, which gives you the time freedom, and then focus on creating the wealth and watch how much more pleasant your journey will be. Yeah, yeah. All right, okay. So, yeah, so focus more on getting the freedom first then worry about yep. wealth later rather than thinking yep. if I have wealth, I'll have freedom because then you just apply too much pressure on yourself in the end. Anyway. Exactly. And, and, and I loved what you said with extra time. What would you do? Spend time with family. That's right. Yeah. See, so family became even, it's always been important to us, but also when we had the time, we would be able to be the ones to show up at all the different celebrations, the parties. Well, family members are going, well, I can't make it. I'm working again. Yeah. Yeah. How is it? You guys are always able to make it. Well, we made it a priority. That's mm. what's important to us. Wow. And so you've got to look at your priorities. You've got to be willing to simplify your life instead of trying to have all the shiny gadgets. Yeah. The temporary pain, think long-term, not short-term. You know, yeah. when you think a long-term and you go for what's my end goal and you're willing to work towards that, the temporary pain will be well worth it. Yeah, no, definitely. I always uh, try to say, think of the – the rewards of the end goal because the short term pain is only short term anyway. And I think that's what stops exactly. a lot of people from going, come, going forward because um, the pain is too great. They, they basically get distracted and do something that feels more comfortable. Yeah. Where yep. success doesn't really come from comfort. It comes from uh, the grind or, you know, digging and deep. Consistency. Yeah? And consistency. And, and, and let's see, you were saying that it's Melbourne cup today. Yeah. So it's, you know, do you think whatever horses win today just stepped on the um, track and um, for their very first race and they're all going to be the winners? <laughs> no, no. Well, no, because they had to it's put the in years a bit of hard of work. Yeah. The years of racing, the years of training, everything. Right. Same yeah. thing. Same thing. We're all those young foals coming in and someone's putting the time into us. You've got to put the time into yourself. Yeah. That's why having a mentor, that's why having coaches is so incredibly important. That's why being around other people, think of how they train horses. They run them with another horse yeah. so that it can see how the other horse is running. So it yeah. can learn, oh, this is how you do it. Yeah. So that same thing with success in our life. So watch, you know, for your, you know, watch a horse race, watch a, a, a professional sports team. Notice what it took for them to get to those elite status. It yeah. takes you first being willing to put the work in. Again, the behind the scenes work for that long-term goal. Yeah. And then how easy your life becomes because now one horse wins at Melbourne Cup today, how much are they going to make? A lot of money for the owners. Yeah, yeah. But it and took a lot of investment in the beginning. That's so true. how are you investing in yourself right now to get those great returns? Because someone looked at me and they go, Robert, you're about to, the company you're with, you know, when it sells, you're going to probably have hundreds of millions of dollars coming to you. Wow, that'd be nice. 
Yes. Uh, yeah, but it started with me selling my first company and losing money. Yeah. yeah. So, it didn't just happen overnight. Yeah. You t- know, and you referred to Harv. Mm. Remember, he started with eight people in his basement that he had to make lunch with or make lunch for and pay to be there. And that was 30 some odd years ago. So yeah, today you look back and you go, wow, he's all over the world. His trains are all over the world. But yeah. that's not how it started. Eight people in the basement. Yeah, that, the- that, that's the thing you don't hear about him. Like, and everyone just basically like just sees the dollar figure and go, this is why he's so rich because he's charged all these. But they don't, they don't hear about that, nor do they hear about like, I've heard because I've listened to his material, but the two thousand dollar credit card that he used to buy the fitness equipment yep. to start the uh, yep. the franchise, or yeah, that he built yep. and then sold on to later, which is, yeah, I guess the other thing, like I, you know, not many people know is like, yeah, you build businesses, but you got to build businesses that you can walk away from and still operate because people you start are interested. Start a business to sell the business. That's, That's it. exactly it. Not hold yep. on to it, yeah. you know. And, and, and when, when I was asked to come into this company, they were going, but Robert, we want to be clear. We're in this to exit. And I'm like, that's why I'm going in. Hmm. Oh, and they, they were shocked. They're like, we thought you'd want to be the, um, you know, to be in it and become more famous. I'm like, no, I like my time at home. Yeah. I like when I'm not on stage, I love, you know, being with family, sitting around a campfire, playing games, watching TV. I like to just enjoy life. Yeah. And, and you know, this is going to create generational wealth and it just so happens that it's, that's what's going to create. That's not why I'm doing it. I'm doing it to create something that I've never created before with a bunch of people I love spending time with, hmm. but I now have to condition myself to go from millions to going, huh, what would I do with hundreds of millions? How many more <laughs> people could I help? How many charities? What good yeah. could I do? The world? Because I'm not conditioned to be at the hundreds of millions yet. And that's the same thing. Someone goes, I tell them, you know, give someone a high five. Say, you have a million or mine. Oh, I have a billion or mine. Are you at a million yet? No. Then get there first. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So Get there and then let's talk about billion. So just create stages and like work towards those stages or those goals and then yep. build upon them further up rather than trying to, be, yep. you know, be at the peak of the summit, you know, without even trying to climb up to the – the yeah. various stages first, yeah? The greatest successes are not the overnight success. It's the 20-year overnight success. Mm, yeah, yeah, I get that. Look, I'm, I'm going to have to wrap it up for now. Like, yeah, we could yeah. go on for ages. Um, but, yeah, if people want to be able to reach out to you, um, what, what very, you're on various platforms. Yeah, you're on, you've got your own podcast. Uh, is that on Apple iTunes? Um, do you have a website and it stuff is. like that? Yeah, you know, easiest way, and here's the thing, Neil, you know, we didn't even talk about my new book coming up, and, um, you know, if, if ever you want me back, just ask. I love having oh, conversations with you. But here, here's, because I believe in my new book, I talk about four, um, four currencies of life, and yeah. one of them currencies is time. I believe one of our great, you know, things is the time that we have. And the fact that you've taken your precious time to interview me, I so appreciate that. And the fact that your mm. listeners have taken their precious time to listen to you and I just ramble on, man, I appreciate that. So yeah. the easiest way for people to find me is also to get a gift. Yeah. And my first book, Success Left a Clue, if they just go to my name, Robert Riopel, just yeah. R-O-B-E-R-T-R-I-O-P-E-L.com, they're actually going to be able to download the entire digital copy of my first book, which is an international bestseller, oh. as our gift to them for listening. And mm. if I don't know if it's still up, but they might want to check. Um, and if, when they download, they also have the opportunity to get on a one-on-one 20-minute call with me Mm. where I go through and do a personalized um, success roadmap with them. Wow. And, if, and I don't sell them anything. In that 20 minutes, they have to fill out a questionnaire before they can actually get on the call with me. But in that 20 minutes, I will actually help them see what roadblocks are holding them back and overcome to have a greater life. And that 20 minutes is just me sure being there to be of service to them. And so we're about to take that down if they haven't already so they might want to jump on as quick as possible. <laughs> okay. And they can also follow you on um, LinkedIn. Yeah, I noticed that on LinkedIn you do a lot of quotes. And you're, you're pretty active on LinkedIn, aren't you? You know, trying to provide some well, inspiration that's, that's out there to everyone. Assistant. That's my assistant helped me do that. <laughs> oh, smart, <laughs> I, I, man. I, I like that. all the credit. Yeah, <laughs> yeah LinkedIn and, um, you know, LinkedIn and she tells me I'm also on Instagram. 
Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, see, there you go. That's how important – like you're reaching out so many people but you've managed to have other people assist you in it while you can focus on other successes in your life. And that's the key takeaway in everything because most people try to do everything on their own. Um, you know, it's either it costs too much money or – they're not going to do it as good as how I would do it. Um, but you've got to just let them do it. And then obviously you have to assess as things go on. And if things aren't working Absolutely. well. You, you still take responsibility for overseeing things. Mm. But if someone has got it and they're you know, working it, you let them, let them spread their wings. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah. yeah. So, so what, I'll, what I'll do is I'll drop all the links. Um, what I'll do is after I'll grab some links off you. Leave them in this description of the video um, on YouTube. And, yeah, basically anyone out can reach out there for you today. But to all my guests there Perfect. today, yep, to all my guests today, um, don't forget to smash the like button if you enjoyed today's episode with Robert Riopel. Um, show us some love with YouTube so YouTube can share it with everyone else out there and suggest it to people. And, yeah, if you haven't subscribed already, definitely hit the sub subscription button. I think it's down in the bottom left. Bottom left, I think. Yeah, we'll work it out. <laughs> I think it's on that side. Um, and smash it's somewhere, <laughs> somewhere, yeah, somewhere at the bottom. Is I think YouTube's actually just updated their platform and how you see things. So I've got to go back and have a good look at it. But um, as well as that, smash that notification bell, and I think it's all that you hit. And every time a new episode comes out, you'll be able to be on the notification in regards to it. But from myself today. Neil Coots and Robert Raymond Riopel. I'd like to thank you very much for your time, for tuning in. And, um, yeah, thank you very much and have a good day. 